question is that the British government and the media in this country, they want to separate the Muslim community into two by saying that there are some Muslims who are extremists and there are some Muslims who are moderate. Uh, the extremist ones are those who speak out you know, about Iraq and Afghanistan, like, like you said, and they criticize the foreign policy. Um, so how, my question is, how as Muslims uh, should we show a united front and what kind of things should we discuss and respond uh, to show that we are united on this? Well, there was a question that the government has said there are some Muslims extremists, there are some Muslims moderate, a Muslim is a Muslim. Allah says in the Quran, Surah Baqarah, chapter number two, verse number 208, enter into Islam wholeheartedly. If you're a Muslim, you enter into Islam wholeheartedly, otherwise you're a pseudo-Muslim. So I call either Muslim or pseudo-Muslim. Nothing like extremist Muslim and modern Muslim. Either you're a Muslim or you're a pseudo-Muslim. A good practicing Muslim or not a good practicing Muslim. There's nothing like extremist. If you have to be a Muslim, Allah says, Udkhulu fisil mikahfa. You can't say, I want to follow this part of the Quran, that part I don't want to follow, and to take this hadith and that hadith. If the hadith is say, you have to take. If it's not say and you reject it, that is good. But if it is say hadith, you have to take it. So there's nothing like extremist and moderate. A Muslim is a Muslim if he follows the Quran and Sunnah. If the government says those people who speak about Afghanistan and Iraq, they are called extremist Muslim, I said, yes. I'm extremely kind, so my heart does bleed for the people who have died in Iraq and Afghanistan. My heart does bleed. <laughs> if the government has a problem because I'm extremely kind, then that's their problem, it's not my problem. It's my haq. I'm a human being. Any other human being who's an innocent human being, who's terrorized, who's killed, I will speak on that behalf because I'm a human being first. Before a British, I'm a human being. I'm not a British at all. I'm saying, what do you have to reply? I'm a tourist, I'm an Indian. We have to realize that, yes, if the government is saying that we are speaking something, if we are supporting those people who are terrorizing innocent people, then it's wrong. We are surely not supporting any human being who's terrorizing innocent human beings. But those people who are terrorizing innocent human beings, if we speak against them, yes, we do that. But we aren't speaking in favor of them. So irrespective of that person, whether he's an American or a British, or whoever he is, whether Muslim or non-Muslim. So it is the duty of every Muslim, as the beloved Prophet Muhammad said. If you see any evil, you stop it with your hand if you can. If you can't stop it with the hand, stop it with the tongue. If you can't stop it with the tongue, the least you can do is curse in your heart. And if you do that, you are the lowest level of movement, the lowest category. So if you feel you can stop it with the hand, stop it. Any evil? If Allah has given you the power to speak, and if you do not speak, Allah will take away your power to speak. If you feel that fine, if you speak and there's a problem, I don't have that guts, at least curse in your heart. If you do that, you're the lowest level. But we should know how to convey the message. What happens many a times, Muslims foolishly make statements. Mashallah, I give statements, you know, in India. Believe me, to do Dawa in Bombay is one of the most difficult places to Dawa. I don't know whether you're aware of Bombay. Bombay, you know? <laughs> it's difficult. It's very easy here. In spite of that, with Allah's help, Alhamdulillah, Summa Alhamdulillah, since the past eight years, we are showing our dawa, hardcore dawa programs, every day in the morning in the cable TV to more than 1.5 million homes. I speak about the Veda openly, I speak about the government, but with hikmah. Following the guidance of Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and our beloved Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa So you should speak with hikmah. I'm very vocal, but how you do it is very important. You know the incidents that took place about the destruction of the statue of Buddha. Buddha statue was destroyed by the Taliban. It was shameful that all the people that came on the media, all the so-called Islamic scholars, all of them condemned that what they broke the statue is wrong, is wrong, is wrong. When I came on the media, I said that if the Muslim scholars feel that speaking in favor of the people who have destroyed the Buddha statue is going to cause problem to the Muslim Ummah, the least they can do is keep their mouth shut. Least. There's a question asked to me by a Hindu that just because the Afghanis, they were in power, they destroyed the statue, in India it will never happen, no one will destroy a statue, so how does Islam permit this? I told them that in Bombay city, outside the domestic airport in Santa Cruz, there's a big statue of Mahavir. The Jains, they believe in Mahavi. It was unclothed statue. So people took objection. So the government was forced to put a wall 
on the private part of the statue. After a few months, they removed the statue. Now, the same people who objected on the statue being there, today are condemning those people who destroyed the Buddha statue. There are more Jains living in Bombay and India than Buddhists living in Afghanistan. <laughs> As a student of comparative religion, I said, what happened, I don't know. But one thing I know for sure, that the Afghanis, they are educating the Buddhists. Because Buddha never said, make a statue of me. Buddha never said, you should do idol worship. I am a student of comparative religion. I have read Dhamma Padda. So these Taliban of Afghanis, they are educating the Buddhists that Buddha never said, make a statue of me. He never said, do idol worship. So they are educating them. So one press reporter asked me, Brother Zakir, but don't you think that it hurt the feelings of millions of Buddhists. Does Islam give permission to hurt the feeling of human being? I said, under normal circumstances, no. But sometimes the father is cruel to be kind. I asked him a question. That suppose the Indian government catches a haul of drugs worth about 5 million pounds, 10 crore rupees, whatever it is. What does the government do? So the reporter told me, the government will burn the drugs. I said, do you know Millions of human beings, for them, drug is their god. So when the government burns the drug, won't it hurt the millions of drug addicts? He'll say yes. So are you for the government or against the government? I'm for the Indian government. I'm for the Indian government because the Indian government, though is hurting the feelings of millions of drug addicts, they know that, see, it will cause harm to them, it will cause health problem. So as far as Akira is concerned, we Muslims know about Akira, inshallah. So there they know that it is beneficial for the Buddhists. And ask the question to the Hindu, that suppose you buy a house, and if there is a carving of the Kaaba in your house, what will you do? I said, won't you destroy it? He was scared to say, I will take it out. But won't you destroy it? Won't you remove the house? He said, yes, because you own the house. So when the Afghanis are owning that country, the statue belongs to them. Who are you to say yes or no? Are they coming to your country and destroying it? And all the scholars who said, Udu ila sabili rabbika bilikma, it is not hikma, it is not hikma. They don't know the context. The context of the verse of Surah Nahal, chapter 16, verse 125, Udu ila sabili rabbika hikma, its first few verses where the ruku starts, it says that in the lifestyle of Prophet Abraham is a beautiful example. What did Prophet Abraham do? Peace be upon him. He broke the statue. <laughs> so Udu ila sabili rabbika bilikma doesn't mean speaking soft. Hikma means conveying the message. Whether you do it softly, how you do it harshly. Hikmah is wisdom. It doesn't mean only soft. Many a time soft is hikmah, sometimes harsh is hikmah. So if we analyze Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, when he came to power, when he came back to Makkah, and he broke all the idols in the Kaaba, and he said with the verse of the Quran, وَقُلْ جَالْ حَقْ وَزَاقَ الْبَاطِلِ إِنَّ الْبَاطِلَ قَانَ وَزَوْقَ When truth is halal again, falsehood, falsehood perishes, for falsehood is by its nature bound to perish. See, if we don't have the power, suppose in India, to do it, no problem, it's not fard. It is not fard. When they have the power, they are doing acts which is mustaf, so what's your problem? But in replying, you should know how to reply, giving examples of the government when you give. So therefore, when you speak, unfortunately, many of us Muslims, out of emotion, we say things, and then we land ourselves into trouble. So if we say with hikmah, giving examples, like today I give example of India, terrorists, and freedom fighters, America, America and British, where are we? They are both having problems. See history, Benjamin Franklin terrorist, George Washington terrorist. So when we give example, it opens up the vision. If not of the government, at least the Britishers. See, the non-Muslim non-fools, the Westerners aren't fools. Whatever the government policy, you speak, be vocal, but speak with hikmah so that we can convey the message of peace to the world. Hope that answers the question. Uh, final question from the sisters. Because